Hello, I'm Matthew King. This is The Music Professor. I'm delighted to welcome you to our first Q&A session. We've got loads of fantastic questions and I'm going to try and answer as many as I can. Before we get into the questions, I should just say that this channel is a collaboration between me and Ian Coulter and making the videos that we are making is very exciting and we're loving doing it but it takes a bit of time and effort and energy. <laughs> Feel free therefore to donate to us either via Patreon or buy us, I think it's called a Kofi or a coffee, buy us a coffee, let's put it that way, which is a one-off payment to the channel because we could really do with your financial assistance. Or PayPal. Or PayPal, Ian's just corrected me, uh, or PayPal. <laughs> Saibandari asks, who are some other female composers you believe should be highlighted more? A fantastic opening question, actually. This follows on from our little video about Clara Schumann a couple of weeks ago, who, of course, is an amazing composer from the 19th century. But there have been a whole rack of amazing women composers that go right back to phenomenally early, actually. Hildegard of Bingham, one of the great composers and poets of the Middle Ages. She was born in 1098. I'm going back to not very long after the Battle of Hastings. And she was a prioress in Germany. And she wrote, I believe it's considered to be the first verse play. So she, you know, a prodigiously Renaissance woman writing plays, writing poems, writing uh, beautiful, beautiful music. So I can give you an example. So that's a little bit of one of her chants. It's called Vis Eterna and it's very beautiful. And you can hear there are lots and lots of recordings of her music out there which are easy to access. One of the most famous albums is called Feather on the Breath of God, which is a quote from one of her poems. So I spent so long on Hildegard, who's one of my favourites, that uh, I need to just rattle through some more. You've got a fine Renaissance composer called Francesca Caccini. There's Barbara Strozzi. Fanny Mendelssohn, the, the sister of Felix <coughs> Mendelssohn. Equally talented, I suspect, although her talent wasn't really allowed to develop quite as much as her brother, who was really a Mozartian uh, figure in the 19th century. But Fanny, Fanny Mendelssohn's piano trio and her piano pieces and songs are terrific. Cécile Chaminade, the French composer, later in the 19th century. And then as you go into the 20th century, you've got people like Ethel Smythe, the great English suffragette composer from the turn of the 20th century. You've got Lily Boulanger, a marvellous French composer who died very, very young in her 20s. I can play you a little bit of one of her piano pieces. So Lily's sister was the famous Nadia Boulanger, probably the most famous music teacher of the 20th century and also a composer. So the Boulanger sisters were, were really significant players in the early 20th century. And then in the later 20th century you have a whole bunch of significant women composers. Kaiosari Aho from Finland, Unsuk Chin from Korea, fantastic composers. And then in the later 20th century we've got all sorts of amazing people like Elizabeth Lutyens, the British serial composer. Quite hard-edged, but fantastic. You've got Hélène Radigue, the great French electronic composer. You've got Pauline Oliveros, the great American composer responsible for all sorts of marvellous music. Meredith Monk, Laurie Anderson. In Russia, you've got Sofia Gubaidulina, 
and Alina Ustfalskaya. Back in the UK, we've got the wonderful Judith Weir, who's currently Master of the King's Music, Cassandra Miller, all sorts of wonderful people, far too many for me to reel off in one go without getting boring, but these are all terrific people. And so the list is getting kind of bigger because there are more and more prominent women composers now. Uh, so Emmanuel asks quite an obscure question, if a Mixolydian flat 6 mode exists, which is its dominant degree and which is one example of cadence to dominant in this mode? Um, now, I'm not sure if I can immediately come up with an example. This is obscure for a number of reasons. The mode isn't known as the Aeolian dominant, but it consists of... The first four notes are like a major scale and the top four notes are like the the descending melodic minor scale and the two tetrachords I suppose one is going that way and that one is going that way they're perfectly symmetrical that's kind of cool so in other words the intervals are perfect inversions of one another and they kind of meet in the middle but really the mode is a sort of it's it's the same as if you let's say we're going in C C D E F G A flat B flat C if we were in F minor, we'd have the same note, so it's sort of F minor, but starting on the fifth degree. And what would an example be of a cadence? Uh, if you were, if, if Stravinsky has a beautiful opening to his uh, the third movement of his Symphony of Psalms, which has something that sounds a little bit like Mixolydian flat six. Um, but it's a scale that you might find in jazz occasionally. Nice. I'd have to think a bit more about. This is just off the hoof, but it's an interesting question, just rather complicated to answer. Okay, so the next question's from Enzar Yukul. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. What do you think about the interpretation debate? Should we be loyal to the original score, or is it fine to get further from it for the sake of personal touch? For example, Pogorelich. So there's a question there about interpretation and is, is the score preeminent or is the interpretation the most important thing? It's a balance. It's really almost the same discussion as if we were talking about Shakespeare and whether you interpret Macbeth, you know, if a famous actor is interpreting that role. Two of the fairest stars in all the heavens. <laughs> yes, they will follow the original script, but they may play it in a very different way from another Macbeth. And sails upon the bosom of the air. So I wouldn't be very happy if, if an actor decides to cut out lines from Shakespeare. And also, I suppose it's terribly important that an actor is aware of iambic pentameter or the rhythms of the original language. And the <coughs> meaning of the original, you know, there is for certain things, the meaning, the rhythm, the alliteration and so on, all these things are crucial parts of the original text and they need to come through in the performance. But there's huge amounts of freedom. And I guess that's to some extent true of music too, that certain things like tempo are somewhat flexible. So one interpreter may play a Schubert sonata considerably slower than another. I still think that there are cases, however, where you might find that an interpreter is simply distorting the original because the tempo that they've chosen or the, the way that they're articulating the music is so perversely strange, Glenn Gould is a famous case, that the music has reached a point of distortion. And I think that is true, particularly when Glenn Gould is playing Mozart and Beethoven, neither of whom are composers. He, he himself said he didn't like them didn't like playing them and yet he bequeathed these frankly bizarre and uh, kind of critical performances of these great composers on the basis that he didn't particularly respect their music. There's something very strange and uh, contrary about that. But his performances of Bach are often eccentric too, but many of his Bach performances are also to some extent inspired. I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of Glenn Gould, but I accept that he was a performer of genius. And the performances are interesting anyway. I mean, they're well worth hearing, aren't they? But there are so many different examples of pianists playing music in an inspired way, even if it isn't entirely orthodox. And who would want a world in which everybody just plays the same? That 
that's kind of awful. We don't want interpreters to be automatons, we want them to be creative artists. So uh, my answer really very, very succinctly is, yes, the score is preeminent and the best performers are those who understand the, the music that's contained within the score. But in the end, the score is only a kind of code and you've got to decode that and transmit the artistic content in that score. And that's where the interpretation comes in.